Good morning, Interweb, Warbuilders Log 47. We are, as always, continuing to warbuild our fictional planet here, placeholder name Kretak. Previously, we'd mapped in our Copper Age ore deposits, then we headed into the Bronze Age, and in what will come as a shock to absolutely no one, in today's video, we're going to finish up the ore trilogy by looking at Iron Age ore deposits. Cannot wait. Should be good crack. The source is Madeline James Wrights. The guide is Deposits and Gemology. The link is in the description. All right, mapping the Iron Age. It makes sense that we start with iron, right? But uh, I'm actually going to scroll down a little bit and start with gold and by extension silver, precious metals. And the reason why I want to start here is sheer and utter laziness. The gold maps and silver maps from the Copper Age and the Bronze Age carry over into this age. So a quick copy and paste and turn on the relevant layer and boom, gold and silver done. Man, do I feel productive right now. Right, enough mucking around, time to get serious. Let's look at iron. Now, it's pretty obvious why iron is important for like the Iron Age. I'm not gonna go into it. We all understand this. We're gonna start with a very early utilized form of iron and that is bog iron. So bog iron forms as a result of oxidation of iron in kind of swamps and marshes and bogs. Pretty straightforward, bog iron, it's all in the name. Now to map bog iron, we're gonna place regions beneath current and previous wetlands downhill of metallogenic belts. So I got wetlands again here are bogs, swamps, marshes. And the reason why we want them downhill from metallogenic belts is we want all of the nice metals that are in the mountains, the metallogenic belts, to feed into the surrounding low-lying regions, into those wetlands, to create the right conditions uh, for bog iron to occur. And the largest of these bogs, and hence bog iron regions, will be in current bogs and swamps with incredibly rich iron groundwater. I'm going to take that to mean if there's a lot of mountains in the area, I'm going to consider putting in a very large bog or swamp. Tons of metal feeding into the wetland. Now our, our big issue here is that wetlands, uh, bog, swamps, marshes are uh, biomes. So here's some guidelines I set myself. So for bogs, uh, I'm going to put these in subarctic climate zones, specifically these climate zones, downhill of metallogenic belts and in low-lying flat regions, right? Makes sense for a bog. For swamps and marshes, I'm going to target three types of climate zone, and that is rainforests, humid subtropical climate zones, and oceanic climate zones, specifically these ones. And in these three cases here, again, I'm going to uh, look for downhill of metallogenic belts, but I'm going to air towards coastlines and along rivers. So yeah, off air, uh, I went ahead and found all the relevant climate zones for those wetlands that this is this sort of uh, weird blue color excellent choice past edgar and yeah i'm just gonna find some wetlands in these zones drop in some bog iron deposits bob's your uncle oh actually no one thing if you're gonna go through this yourself uh, i would encourage you to go hard here we're in the iron age capabilities have leveled up basically more access to more things so uh, put in lots of deposits if you think you've got enough deposits probably put in more. You can always erase later. Anyhow, time off mode, let's do it. Right, so despite me advocating for putting in tons of bog iron, uh, Janar's geography is kind of conspiring against me. Janar isn't exactly a great place for bog iron, mainly because uh, like all of our active mountain ranges are opening out into the sea, no room for bogs. This rift system here is so new, it's not really in the conversation. And this mountain range here is so old that all of its resources have basically been nuked by erosion. Uh, nevertheless, I kind of did what I could, although I probably stretch things a little bit here, but hey ho. Oh, and speaking of stretching things, uh, I also turned on on the large Ignis province layer uh, and in an effort to get more bog iron i figured that when these large Ignis provinces were popping off maybe some iron came along with them they've since been eroded away and some of the iron has been deposited in low-lying wetland regions not sure how kosher that move is but uh yeah that's what i got next up we're going to do pre-industrial iron sources specifically let's start with scarns 
Uh, we talked about these in the previous video, I believe in relation to copper scarns, if I recall correctly. So I won't rehash the full details here. TLDR, they're hydrothermal deposits where basically the ore deposit forms around a magma chamber, like on the outside of the magma chamber. They go in carbonate sedimentary rock, i.e. limestone, adjacent to major subduction zones with non-basaltic volcanic igneous rock. Now, converting that into the parlance of uh, this video, I'm going to place scarring deposits, the vast majority of my scarring deposits in active orogenies, particularly laramide orogenies, anytime I have a carbonate rock region bordering a rhyolitic or andesitic rock region. But I'm also going to throw a small amount of scarring deposits in old orogenies, to uh, indicate, you know, past activity. We covered it in the last video. You know the drill. What are we doing in terms of richness? Uh, scarns, some moderate, most rich. Cool. Let's sketch down some scarns. All right, scarns done. Iron rich laterites. These are going to go in and around our lips, our large igneous provinces, the yellow boils here. If and only if those large igneous provinces fall within our so-called wet dry zone. Recall from previous videos, this zone uh, marks out any sort of subtropical to tropical regions that undergo alternating wet and dry periods. If you're a lip, and you're in this zone, you're going to get yourself some iron-rich laterites. Let's do it. Oh, sorry, no. Uh, what are we doing here? Laterites, most of them will be moderate, rarely rich. Okay, let's go. All right, laterites done. Here's January without the laterites. And here it is with the laterites. Next up. I, I just I just realized something, folks. Um, uh, I've never pronounced this word before. I presume it's oolitic, uh, but I guess I'm kind of infamous for mispronouncing things. Uh, see previous crimes like isotherm and sandwich for evidence thereof. Uh, so just give me a beat here. Okay, so uh, Wiktionary seems to insist that I speak with a UK accent, so uh, I guess oolite? Oolite? Perhaps? Oolitic. Oolitic. Oolite. Okay, no, I'm, 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 <laughs> we're not doing that. It's it's oolite, it's oolitic, and if it's wrong, so be it. Apologies to the entirety of Britain. Now, oolitic iron deposits are essentially uh, a bunch of sedimentary rock that has uh, iron stuck in it. And the rock is characterized by having these kind of like really round grains called, oh, pronunciation here, ooid? Ooid, very good. Looks like this basically. And these sort of deposits form uh, when you have uh, a whole bunch of dissolved metals, in this case, iron being deposited in marine sediment. So with that in mind, we are actually not going to go with Madeline's guidelines here. All of this crack here is great. If you don't have a detailed tectonic history, we do. We're going to do something just a smidge different. Oh, and also while we're here, uh, all moderate. Okay, just make a note of that. So for our purposes here, I'm going to say we're going to put uh, marine oolitic iron deposits in any region where there's carbonate rock and where that region had been a previous warm, that's important, shallow sea, and where that region was fed by a whole bunch of metal rich water flowing off nearby orogenies. So we are going to need to reference our previous shallow seas overlay, which we worked on in previous videos, and our rock map. And for my rock map here, I'm displaying carbonate rock, obviously, but also sediments, just in case there's a region which really should have carbonate rock, but I forgot to mark it in. 
I can repurpose the sediments and we'll pretend I did it right the first time. Also, in addition, I've taken here two snapshots of the tectonic history. This one, I believe, was from 290 million years ago, and this is from 120 million years ago. This chap here is the start of the shallow seas period. This chap here is the end of the shallow seas period. Oh, and the snapshot here is from between zero and 45 degrees north and south. You know, the warm parts of the planet. And I'm basically, I'm going to reference the start point, the end point, and then this shallow uh, seas overlay here. To, to try and help lay down these marine oolitic deposits. The reason why I'm going more granular here than in previous videos is that uh, from testing, um, a lot of the iron deposits in our final map will be marine oolitic deposits. So the more granular I go, the more I feel comfortable adding. <gasps> oh my God, I just, sorry, sorry to interrupt myself. I just noticed something. I've been working on this planet for literal years and I've only just realized that there's a skull in this sea. Yeah, like lower jaw, teeth. It, it's a bit deformed, you know, but a skull nonetheless. <laughs> That's really cool. We should call this place Skull Bay or the Bay of Skulls. That's got an appropriately fantasy ring to it. Anyhow, anyhow, anyhow. Marine oolitic deposits. Let's go. Okay, uh, Janar's geography once again fighting against me. That's about all I could realistically chuck in. And this is because uh, Janar's sort of evolution is kind of boring in the grand scheme of things. It like kind of always hangs around the same latitudes during this period and just kind of moves westward, I guess. So at the beginning of the shallow seas period, I can imagine a whole bunch of water coming in along here, particularly on the base of this mountain range and up along here, but it wouldn't go so far west because we'd expect to be some sort of desert uh, up in the northwest region here. And that basically holds for the entire time period. Like at the end, it's still pretty much in the same position. Shallow seas up along here, in here-ish, nothing in the west. And so we come to uh, this sort of distribution. So uh, penultimate iron is iron from hydrothermal deposits. This is an optional step, but look at iron, it's everywhere. The more the merrier, am I right? I'm gonna modify this guideline ever so slightly in that I'm just gonna take the VMS and the SEDEX deposits that we mapped in the previous video in the Bronze Age and upgrade a few of those sparingly to be uh, iron bearing. And in both instances, VMS and SEDEX, these are gonna be rich deposits. Nothing to it, let's go. Okay, hydrothermal iron, done. Hardly any difference, but it makes my soul happy. Next up. So meteoric iron, I think is probably the most self-explanatory thing we've covered to date. There's a meteor, it falls to the planet, got lots of iron in it, iron deposit. Very straightforward. These are gonna be super rare, like I'm talking maybe one deposit on the continent, maybe. They're gonna be a very rich source of iron and we can throw them anywhere we want, except they're most likely, they're more likely to be discovered in uh, deserts and like tundra areas. In fact, there's a famous one up in Greenland, I believe that the Inuit used to make um, meteoric iron tools. Meteoric iron tools sounds so badass. Yeah, this bio, the Cape York meteorite. Yeah, and the Inuit were using this deposit for centuries to make tools and harpoons. That's so cool. Anywho, this does not merit a time lapse. So let's put on our climate zones. We're gonna look for the gray of tundra or the red of desert. And um, it's a bit out of the way, but you know what? We have so much iron going on here and basically nothing occurring up in the kind of barren north. I'm just gonna throw a meteorite here. Done, that's it. So the next thing Madeline has us do is basically cross-reference our fuel maps from the two videos ago uh, with the iron maps we just made to kind of determine what regions have the potential for large scale Iron Age cultures. These purple regions in Madeline's maps. I'm not gonna do it here. I'm gonna shunt that off into the next video when we actually go to place our culture. So moving swiftly on, we come to the final thing we're gonna map in this video. 
And that's zinc. Ah, zinc. The metal that sounds like it should be a character in the Matrix films. Used medicinally and crepe brass, very fun, improves brands, alloys, how delightful. Now, for the first two tips here, we're going to roll these into one. As Madeline states, uh, zinc almost always is found with lead. So what we're going to do is we're going to take all the lead we marked in the previous video and we're just going to place a bit of zinc next to it. That's step one. Step two, we are going to put zinc in contact areoles around our mafic rocks. And what that basically means is we're going to find our large igneous provinces and the border between the basaltic rock in our large igneous provinces and the metamorphic rock that surrounds it. There, we're going to stick in some zinc deposits. That's step two. And then step three, just randomly, wherever, in carbonate sedimentary rocks, we're just going to place down a couple of bits of zinc with lead around large igneous provinces and just randomly about the gaff. All right, let's go. Okay, that's our zinc with lead, the uh, light blue color. And also we're not differentiating grade here. There's no poor, moderate, rich. It's all the same. Just zinc. Finally, random zinc. Okay, zinc done. Without random bits, with random bits. Try to like balance clustering these deposits together and also kind of spreading them out at the same time. Think I did an okay job? Good enough for now anyways. So yeah, that's us uh, basically done. Madeline goes on to top up brass. We're going to yeet that topic till a uh, future video. Essentially, all we're going to do is take the zinc deposits that we just mapped and cross-reference them with our copper rich areas to determine whether or not any people's in that area would have the resources at hand uh, to be able to work with brass. We'll analyze this on a more local scale. So yeah, then gold and silver, we got that done. And that's it. We're on to the post-industrial age, which we are not going to talk about because I just don't want industrial or post-industrial age peoples knocking about Cretac. Remember, the goal of the series is kind of to do the sort of stock, sort of fictional setting, but to do it in just obscene amounts of gory detail, which I think I've achieved in fairness. But all this detail comes at the cost of time and it has taken me so long to get to this point. Oh my god, it's been three years. This is ridiculous. This is crazy. So uh, in the interest of saving a little bit of time, I reached out to Madeline and I was like, hey, so you got some gemstone stuff in your guide. That'd be really cool to know about. Um, but I just don't have the time to map all this. And it's not like as mission critical as an ore map is, right? So I was like, hey, Madeline, any chance I can commission you to make a gemstones map for me? And Madeline being just the absolute sound boy that she is, was totally on board and she made this delightful looking fella. How cool is that? Look at all this lovely jewelry hiding beneath the Janarian sands. I think we got, what's that, tanzanite? The green here is jadeite. I think this yellow here is diamond, I think. In any case, we will further analyze this map and work with it in future videos on a regional scale. But just shout out Madeline. Thank you so much. This is all done using her guide. So if you want to create a map just like this one, check out her guide. Links in all the usual places. So yeah, our trilogy done. We went from the Copper Age into the Bronze Age. And today we hit up the Iron Age. Delightful. So thank you so much for watching, folks. I really hope you enjoyed. Thanks to the patrons for supporting the show. Shout out Madeline again, absolute legend. And of course, as always, world building pasta for the constant correspondence. Have a great one. And until next time, it grows.